Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, all of these platforms have one single thing in common. They're all run by companies that ultimately are guided by their CEO. Zuckerberg, for instance, makes decisions about the direction of Facebook and Instagram all the time, and you have no control over which way he goes. But it doesn't have to be that way. There doesn't have to be some big bad corporation at the end of the line. And this is where decentralized social media comes into play. There are a lot of companies doing everything that they can to give power back to the internet's users by breaking that system of control and one person at the top and letting you decide what content you want. And there are good things and bad things that go along with this. So today we're going to talk about what makes decentralized social media different, why it's interesting for businesses, and then we're going to look at the top two platforms just to understand how this works right now. My name is Trent Canelli. I'm a Web3 marketing strategist. And this is the best place to learn about Web3, the metaverse, NFTs, and how to market it all. So if that sounds good to you and you're excited, make sure that you like this video. Subscribe to my channel if you're into it. Comment to let me know what you know about decentralized social media. If you've never heard of it before, that's even okay. Or decentralization in general. I would love to know kind of where you are at the beginning of this. And let's get started. Okay, so what makes this different? So decentralized social media, to some extent, is what it sounds like. It is decentralized and it's social media. So traditional social media is centralized. There's a single company running a platform and making all the decisions about that platform for you, which is why we end up seeing things like Twitter bans and data breaches on TikTok that are actually sanctioned by the company in China and Facebook acting more like a propaganda machine than some neutral, politically neutral service. And what this centralization ends up meaning is that the platform itself is playing mommy or daddy. It's effectively making decisions for you about what you should and shouldn't be seeing on the internet. Now I say the internet and not just these sites because truly social media is an enormous driver of almost everything that we do online. So just consider this. As of Q3 2021, we spent an average of six hours and 58 minutes online every day. And two hours and 27 minutes of that time is on social media. That's 35% of our internet time on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. So let's blow this up a little bit more. So just think about what other things take 35% of your time. In a day, sleeping is 35% of your time. So is working, that is also 35% of your time. So if you consider how much of your internet time, how much of your data gathering, your information, what you're doing online for work is spent on social media, that is a huge driver of everything that we do online. And those things affect how you function day to day in a very real way. If you just consider how much time you're spending gathering data from social media sources, it's going to affect how you think, how you react to the news that you hear, everything that you do in a day. And because it's mommy and daddy giving you the information for what you should think, that changes the game for how we are reacting to the world because it's really just how they think we should be reacting to the world, right? And decentralization aims to correct that because a decentralized social media channel aims to give that power back to the users by detaching mommy and daddy, detaching that corporate overlord from the equation and not letting them have any say in what we think we should be getting as data from the social media channel. And in this way, some people might argue that decentralized social media is also unique for having freedom of speech because decentralized social media allows you to splinter off from a more centralized system while also sloughing off the oversight from that system as well, which means that those people don't have to worry about admins coming in and censoring or demonetizing content or behavior that they don't agree with. But before you go going, wow, that's the best thing ever. I think decentralized social media is the future and it's the highest virtue we can have. I think we need to realize that this actually doesn't fix all problems with social media. And in some ways it might actually make them worse. See, as hard of a time as we give Meta for their content policy, I have to say that they're really between a rock and a hard place. This isn't to say that they're blameless. They can always do better and they have to do better. But the content moderation team is trying really hard to catch every issue and address it appropriately. And that said, there are a lot of different niche issues that have to be considered more than you might realize. From what makes something newsworthy to when a political stance crosses a policy threshold, there's actually a lot to consider. And there's a great episode of Radiolab, the podcast that everybody has probably heard of, that I encourage you to listen to on this topic, which I'll, I'll put a link for in the description. But the fact that they do have to work that hard makes it pretty clear that there are a lot of groups out there with a lot of different and sometimes pretty fringe beliefs and interests, which can lead people 
equal to the much darker and murkier pits of the internet. And that should make you nervous because due to the lack of regulation on these spaces, decentralized social media can potentially lead to more extreme beliefs being adopted more quickly by more people. So just to understand the angle I'm looking at here, let's talk about 8chan. 8chan wasn't really decentralized social media in the way that we're thinking about it in this video, but it nonetheless touted by its founder a mentality of having free thought where anybody could do and be anything. It was like a mecca. And then QAnon was created on the platform. And the creator of 8chan himself has gone and denounced the platform as well as its current owners who are believed to be behind the QAnon account. It's kind of a theory that like nobody really knows, but that's a whole different video and a whole different genre. So 8chan went from being this optimistic, be your own person type website to one that foments some really toxic and politically harrowing things. Now, of course, that's one of the worst examples of decentralized social media's effect on society. There are also many positive examples. So we shouldn't think of decentralized social media as inherently bad or inherently good. It really isn't either. Really, other than getting away from centralization itself with the current social media model, it's really healthiest to just be very aware of your environment and kind of what you're getting involved with in decentralized social media. The more things change, the more they seem to stay the same, especially in an area like this with so many different ideas. So in the same way that social media has benefits and detriments, it's really healthy to think of that in the same way with decentralized social media. There are benefits and detriments. Which means that decentralized social media is something that could be really interesting for businesses. So let's talk about how that is right now. The first way that this is true is tighter niches. So right now, if you go onto Instagram or Facebook, YouTube, whatever, and you target a specific small niche, so let's say NFTs, you're guaranteed to also touch other niches as well and get those people in those audiences to be looking at your content, like fast or art or something, something that isn't really related to NFTs. That's because generally these centralized platforms like Instagram or Facebook are feeding your content to a less customized, less niche audience. But on decentralized social media, the audience is the group of people using the platform. It is much more niche just by design. There might be some breakdown into subgroups, but in general, your target is in one single place and that makes targeting organically so much easier. Incentives for creators also take on a different form. So normally anybody trying to gain organic traffic on social media would need to understand the elusive algorithm that's constantly changing. But decentralized social media in many cases is a direct democracy. People vote with their fingers and say what they're interested in and what they aren't. So instead of trying to guess what's gonna get in front of your audience, you can know exactly what they think of every post you make, which is huge for honing your message and building virality with that audience more directly than ever before. Which also means that selling to those people is, once again, much easier because you're not spending boatloads of money to reach that audience. You've instead crafted that message to reach them organically. And speaking of that algorithm, there is of course code behind these platforms. There has to be an algorithm for decision making and that sort of stuff. But there's another cool distinction here between decentralized social media and traditional social media. And that is that decentralized social media's algorithms are open source. You can typically look at the source code of almost every decentralized social media platform out there, which means that there's no guessing. You have direct access to exactly what's required to win on one of these platforms. Now there's a lot more reasons to be in business on decentralized social media than this. But this is a great surface level basis for wanting to get your business on there right now. So if you want a little more deeper information, start doing your research right now. But otherwise, I think you should really dive Dive in. So now that we understand that, let's get a little bit of a better understanding about the top two platforms that are being used today. This should help us kind of see those issues and those ideas that come into play a little bit better. First up is DTube. So you might guess from the name, but DTube is a decentralized competitor to YouTube. Decentralized tube, okay? And the first thing that you'll notice about it is that it's a platform where you have to give before you can get. They're really trying to build out an intentional community here because they're designing their economy around the community. There are two types of currency on DTube. There's DTube coin or DTC and voting power VP. So DTC is their crypto, which you can earn by posting and voting on content on their site. You can then cash in your DTC every seven days because that's when it vests. The other type is VP or voting power. So VP is really what's needed to take those actions on the site. You need to have a certain amount of DTC, which then translates into VP. And with VP, you can take actions on the site, like liking videos, uploading your own content, commenting, etc. And those all require VP, which is converted from that DTC. It's a little bit complicated. 
This is really interesting because right now you can provide deep content for people to benefit from and that drives their interest while also getting those that do watch and vote to show real intention about the engagement choices that they're making on the platform. And with DTube's direct democracy, it's a lot easier to see how that voting power affects the virality of the video. I mean, if it's bad enough, it'll actually get blurred out. So you have to mouse over the content just to see what it is. That's when you see real voting power in action. This is choice and self-censorship in a decentralized environment at its best, while also providing access for businesses that understand how it works. And then the second one I wanted to talk about is Mastodon. So this is probably the best known decentralized social media platform out there today. It's kind of like decentralized Twitter. Now, one big difference that you're gonna to start to notice is there are two basic camps for what it means to be decentralized. Some think that it means direct control to the users, but all those users can all more or less be in the same place. Others think that it means giving a totally separate instance of a platform for niches to enjoy. So what DTube did is have everybody in one place, DTube.com, and they do that really well because that direct democracy allows that voting to happen. Whereas Mastodon waves that flag for total compartmentalization, for having a separate instance for your community and your niche. On Mastodon, you're gonna to go to their website and you're gonna see that there's a list of communities that you can join. And while Mastodon is a free, decentralized group of individual communities like we've talked about, out, you're also probably going to notice that that list on their website is kind of free of that element of hate or toxicity that you might often expect from platforms like these. That isn't to say that it doesn't exist. I don't want you to think that. Actually, it really does, which is an unfortunate truth as we've discussed. In fact, Donald Trump's Truth Social is built on Mastodon. So how do they solve this problem? Well, the only place right now to get a comprehensive list of all the instances of Mastodon that are out there is to go to Mastodon's site and look through their catalog. On that catalog, it specifically says that they don't list instances that support violence, hate, bigotry, sexism, etc., which means that these communities do exist, but they aren't gonna be promoted at all by the platform. Is it perfect? No but this is probably the best that they can do at this moment while keeping that freedom. It's really kind of a tough balance. That said, it's also gonna be more interesting for businesses to pursue communities that are publicly posted and easily available. These communities are most likely to be joined since other people can easily find them. And again, given how niche focused each community is, you have a good chance of capturing their interest and attention more quickly and easily because it is just like this tower. It's one building looking at another one. So there you go. There are a lot of great things to consider with decentralized social media, but you have to take the good with the bad and market on those platforms that do the best job of demonetizing hate while giving freedom back to their users. So let me know if you have any questions. I would love to know what you've done with decentralized social media up to this point. Otherwise, make sure that you like this video, subscribe to my channel if you're into it, and I will catch you in the next one.